Hello everyone, my name is Cristela Camera, and for my Contemporary Issues project I decided to focus on bullying. I personally believe bullying is a large issue in the modern education system, and I will discuss in this presentation the history of bullying, but especially now with the rise of school shootings and the threat of school safety on the line, I find it to be incredibly important for modern educators to be well versed in the implications of bullying and the necessary political and social steps one must take in order to be well prepared to address the issue. Beyond this, I find bullying to be incredibly personal, especially since I have fallen victim to the practice and I've seen this behavior in school environments directed towards other students, as well as having heard stories about family and friends becoming victims of bullying. Now, as an employee of my former high school, I hear about its continued practice and I work towards helping students overcome it. Throughout this presentation, there are multiple approaches and different perspectives I would like to address, including my own, which I will save for a discussion at the end. But I have found that there are mainly four elements that could comprise any approach or perspective on bullying. And these include legislation, or the passage of laws, education, that is, through the training of personnel and educating students about the issue, security, involving the reinforcement of the building and the maintenance of the security of students and staff, and finally, mental health, so counseling or general promotion of mental well-being and the inclusion of resources for both victims of bullying and potential bullies. First off, I would like to address the public policy that will be the starting point for this presentation. This is the Dignity for All Students Act, which was passed in 2010, and since its passage into New York State legislation, the Act has undergone various amendments and includes heightened awareness for the presence of the LGBTQ student population, as well as historically underserved minorities. For example, in recent years, Mario Cuomo helped to incorporate the Crown Act into DASA, which addresses the issue of bullying for minorities that might wear headdresses or other traditional articles of clothing meant to be worn around the head um, in the school environment, where they could become victims of bullying. So the importance of DAS in this context really is its tie to the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment focuses on the illegality of discrimination. The Dignity for All Students Act serves as a protection of minorities, when bullying includes a discrimination against color, race, religion, sex, or other similar qualities, it becomes discriminatory harassment. However, it is important to note that this piece of legislation was introduced in 2010, and we will be analyzing other data samples to evaluate uh, other approaches to anti-bullying and their ultimate effectiveness. So before we get into evaluating the different perspectives of bullying and considering a variety of data samples, I find it important to visit the history and the origin of the term. One of the sources I used in my research stood out in particular as especially useful for my evaluation of its historical context. And this is Hyojin Ku's A Timeline of the Evolution of School Bullying in Different Social Contexts, which was published in 2007. Ku details the first public recognition of bullying as having occurred in the 19th century with the murder of John O.D. The murder occurred on August 6th, 1862, when a mentally tormented John Flood, while intoxicated, shot down John O.D. Flood was promptly taken into custody and sentenced to death. However, unbeknownst to the court, the reason behind the murder stemmed from illegal court marshalling practices on behalf of British officers, of which John O.D. was a member of. Unfortunately, John Flood was one of the victims of this unwarranted justice system. The frequent stripping and whipping of John Flood ultimately led to mental degradation and the decision to kill John O.D. Luckily, very close to his execution date, the true nature of the crime was revealed. The public found out about the illegal court martial practices, and the Queen was able to pardon Flood's death in favor of life imprisonment. In the papers, the aggressive behavior of the British officers towards subordinates was labeled as bullying, and this, according to Ku, is considered the first public recognition in a journal of the term. And 
we see one of the articles referencing the incident on the left. That left photo is an article before uh, the public knew about the court marshalling practices, and we can see how it details the shock regarding the murder of O.D. Now, unfortunately, there's general radio silence regarding bullying after the O.D. murder until the latter half of the 20th century, nearly 100, late, 100 years later. And this is when uh, Peter Paul Heinemann, a German-born Swedish radio host, described what we know as bullying, but under a different name. He published his book, Group Violence Among Children and Adults, in 1972, which addressed a term called mobbing. In Heinemann's opinion, mobbing was an animalistic behavior and a natural inclination of humans to band together against a certain individual. However, in 1993, Dan Olwius, a Swedish-Norwegian psychologist, revisited the opinions of Heinemann and reconsidered bullying as an aggressive response to the existence of a power imbalance. In his book, Bullying at School, What We Know and What We Can Do, always details his opinions on the source of bullying, as well as a series of approaches he believes would be appropriate, among which included increased supervision of students during free time, establishment of social groups among teachers and students, days for teacher conferences to discuss the issues, as well as conferences with bullies themselves. Unfortunately, these innovative preventative measures of Oweas did not find their way in time to Columbine High School before the tragic shooting that has forever changed the landscape of the American education system. On April 20th, 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold killed 12 students and one teacher while wounding 21 other people. In the chaos, Harris and Klebold took their own lives, leading to a total of 15 lost lives caused by bullying. Harris and Klebold were brutally harassed, in particular by student athletes. However, little to no action was taken to stop the bullies. The athletes had a notorious reputation throughout the school, and according to Lorraine Adams and Dale Rusikoff's findings, there existed a quote-unquote cult of the athlete in which the figures were venerated and their transgressions ignored. At Columbine, a sort of rivalry developed between the jocks and the so-called trench coat mafia, which is a term developed by the jocks to insult their victims. The divisive atmosphere and persistent harassment cannot be ignored as the point of inspiration for the violent revenge plan of Harrison Klebold. Lorraine Adams and Dale Rusikoff provide an excellent point that in the aftermath, blame was turned towards the mental illnesses of the killers, including their inconsistencies with using prescribed antidepressant medications and their admiration for violent video games and movies. However, the authors include Joyce Hooker's questioning of the fact that athletes were the target victims. This creates the grounds for suspecting and questioning the hostile behavior of the athletes as a cause of the massacre, which, for educational institutions, should not be ignored to prevent future tragedies. Bullying poses a clear threat for adolescents, both for the mental health of the victims, but also in the form of potential mass killings as seen at Columbine. So, in response to Columbine, a clear need to change and revise the approach to dealing with violence in school environments and acts of bullying or harassment developed. StopBullying.gov provides a relatively comprehensive list of procedures to follow when responding to a harassment complaint, which I decided to include a picture of on this slide. However, I would like to bring our attention to the fact that in the advised procedures, it includes the step to providing monitors or additional adult supervision in areas where harassment occurs. After Columbine, there was a necessity to maintain school security and prevent pardon potential violence. In my own school, I remember seeing law enforcement patrolling the hallways and security guards posted throughout the building. I felt there was a degree of safety being met, but it did come at a price of fear of authority at times. StopBullying.gov also determines the necessary response to bullies, including the provision of services for the harasser if needed. One of the last bullets StopBullying.gov provides in its harassment complaint response procedure details the need for schools to provide services to a student who is denied a benefit 
which introduces the topic of the presence of mental health programs, or the ability to cooperate with a student to create the best possible opportunity for academic success and mental well-being. At Lisley University, a different perspective is explored by Nancy Bairdle. Bairdle claims that one of the best preventative measures schools can take is establishing the positive social climate and deepening the connection between students. In contrast to the StopBullying.gov harassment response procedure, Bertel focuses on preventing the measure altogether through this connection among students and with students. While connection with a student that has become a victim of bullying is certainly an important element of an appropriate response, establishing connection prior to the event of bullying can reduce the possibility of it happening, according to Bertel. While considering different perspectives on approaches to the issue of bullying can offer different lenses to analyze anti-bullying, it can also be beneficial to evaluate the data of legislation that has been passed in response to bullying. Here's a bar graph of data collected over the span of 15 years, which shows the amount of anti-bullying laws incorporated into state legislation annually. I found it to be especially important to consider the change in quantities of laws over the span of the time between 1999 and 2000, as well as 2012 and 13. During these times, America fell victim to violent tragedies, with the first being Columbine in 99 and then Sandy Hook in 2012. The graph shows an immediate increase in added laws in the following year, but the legislative process starts to slow down the year after. This demonstrates a desire to immediately remedy a present issue, but also shows a near abandonment in the years following that immediate aftermath period. Unfortunately, this course of action and political engagement with anti-bullying legislation could have a negative effect on bully pre prevention and prove to be ineffective. This slide includes some very interesting data points that are collected from the Digest of Education Statistics. Now, the information presented here builds off my claims I mentioned in the slide prior. Although the dates do not compare efficiently with the last graph dating from 1999 to 2014, it is interesting that 22.2% of students from ages 12 to 18 reported being bullied in 2019. In 2013, the percentage of students was 21.5%. So over the course of six years between 2013 and 2019, there's actually an increase in 0.7% of bullying among students. I find this statistic in particular to be very disappointing because it demonstrates the potential ineffectiveness of current anti-bullying practices, especially considering that towards the beginning of the century, there are very few anti-bullying laws being introduced into legislation, and we see that by the end of that chart in 2014, there is a significantly larger number of laws being added annually. This next bar graph is another testament to the idea that perhaps some of our anti-bullying practices are really not benefiting our students. In this graph, we can see the amount of LGBTQ students that were bullied in LGBTQ affirming and unaffirming schools. Essentially, an affirming school is a school that openly accepts and supports LGBTQ students. Unfortunately, when considering the data, we can see that there's a negligible difference between the affirming and unaffirming schools. While there is a bit of a difference in that unaffirming schools report higher rates of bullying, the percentage differences are not that significant, surprisingly. And this shows that despite preventative measures being taken to counteract bullying, a noticeable amount of bullying still occurs, unfortunately. So, the rise of shootings and school violence may have indicated to the American public that there is a need to include heightened security in schools. However, this table includes information I found from an article written for the Century Foundation by Walter Jean-Jacques and Maya T. Miller. Essentially, this slide demonstrates the importance of considering the potential consequences anti-bullying procedures might have on other minorities. Unfortunately, police relations with minorities have reached high tensions in recent years, and the inclusion of more security personnel and law enforcement in school buildings 
could negatively impact young members of minority groups. As seen in the table, it is 2.3 times more likely that a black student will be subject to a school-related arrest. For this reason, the perspective backing increased security presence becomes less clear-cut regarding its positive impact. Instead, these increased security measures could potentially have a negative effect. In Detroit, for example, heightened security required students to wear IDs around their necks with a zero-tolerance policy. In an article for Michigan Live, journalist Gus Burns describes how former Cody High School student Michael Reynolds was suspended for not having his ID. And then while out of school, Reynolds was then taken into custody by the police for his supposed truancy, despite not even being able to attend Cody High. Considering this example in relation to the data, it is crucial not to disregard the cultural impact a policy can have. So, considering the ineffectiveness of current anti-bullying measures in place at schools and employees at the legal level, including the Dignity for All Students Act, I find it necessary to briefly discuss some of the possible solutions and other courses of action my old school has taken to address the issues. So on the legal level, perhaps it could be beneficial to students to create amendments to DASA to detail clear protocol dealing with bullying and push for the inclusion of specific protections of more minorities. Moving forward, education is a key element of preventing bullying in schools. Educators, including teachers and teaching assistants like myself, Alongside administrators, must be well-versed in bullying behavior. Proper training enables faculty to take an appropriate course of action when confronted by bullying. In my own experience, before becoming an employee of my former high school, it was necessary to complete multiple training modules in video format, which covered aspects of the Dignity for All Students Act, anti-bullying procedures, sexual abuse information, and other general information for proper workplace etiquette. I also found that my high school, middle school, and elementary school excelled in the education field with the inclusion of assemblies that featured speakers of parents, including the father of Rachel Scott. His daughter was one of the victims at Columbine, and he later founded the Rachel's Challenge, which became a well-known student organization throughout the nation, and especially in my own high school. Ryan Halligan's father was another guest speaker at my schools, and I remember hearing about Ryan's story when he was a student that was unfortunately pushed to take his own life at the age of 13 after a vicious rumor spread around online um, saying that Ryan Halligan was gay, and due to cyberbullying, his life was cut short, but his father fortunately continues to help spread anti-bullying sentiment by visiting schools and sharing Ryan's story. So, mental health is another one of the four key elements of anti-bullying that I believe to be necessary in any approach, and underneath the mental health category, some measures might include the formation of student groups, such as the Friends of Rachel organization, present at my high school, and the general maintenance of a social climate, which now, as an employee in my school, Acting as a teaching assistant, I find that their approach to this maintenance of a social climate is exceptional. Because in the morning, after the announcements, they include what is called a mindful moment. And it's essentially a short meditation period in which a speaker asks students to join and concentrate on a positive uh, feeling in order to start the day off on a good note. And there is another meditation period on occasion after third period following the uh, school news, which further reinforces just positive feelings throughout the school. Now, I also mentioned that counseling is an important aspect of mental health and I have participated in this course of action that my high school advises because as a teaching assistant, I bounce around room to room with various students 
as a one-on-one -on -one at times or just working in resource rooms with multiple students. However, I did have one occasion with one of my students that was experiencing uh, bullying. And I had not known about this until another teacher had told me about it. But I'd recognized the signs and I'd spoken with the student, unaware of what was going on. And he requested to speak with someone and I was able to provide that resource. So I feel the availability of that resource is a necessary component of a proper plan to addressing bullying and makes an integral part of any well thought out course of action. There's also the mindfulness room, which uh, I have passed by on occasion and it's a welcoming room situated within the high school and welcomes students to come de-stress and speak with any of the staff to work through issues they might have. But finally, security is another part of anti-bullying. Unfortunately, this is just not as much of a preventative measure as it is a reactionary. It's more of an intervention style method to stop the continuation of bullying, but I believe it is absolutely necessary to include security personnel and potentially law enforcement, especially considering the um, violent shootings in recent history. So, in order to prevent heightened disciplinary action, though, against minorities, as we had seen before, as a perspective against the inclusion of heightened security in schools, it is crucial to educate. So this is where education and security come together. We need to educate security personnel to engage bullying and school violence in an appropriate manner. And likewise, at the same time, we should encourage discourse among faculty and establish a positive connection between the faculty and students. So in summary, I believe legislation, education, mental health, and security are all important aspects of maintaining a positive school environment where bullying is minimized. And I would just like to hear from you guys if you have any suggestions or what you would do differently when developing a culturally aware approach to anti-bullying and appropriate response procedures. So thanks for listening and I hope you have a great day.